Good morning, guys. Good morning to one and all present over here. Converse welcomes you to its 12th episode. Converse is a platform designed by the BCom department. It conducts panel discussions on various ongoing topics in the global economy. These panel discussions helps the panelists to improve their public speaking skills, overcome stage fear and build confidence. These discussions are also very informative to the audience as it helps them and provides them with different perspectives about the topic. The panel discussions are recorded and uploaded on the college YouTube channel, thus giving an access to millions of viewers. Well, as they say, tough times make tougher people. Converse is back with its 12th episode and virtual this time on the topic COVID-19 and the world trade, the new normal. We have come up with a topic which is most relevant in today's pandemic world. We would like to start this event by invoking the Almighty's presence. I would like to warmly welcome our principal, Father Daniel Fernandez, our HOD, Dr. Sugandhi Pierce, faculty professors, and all the students. I would like to warmly welcome our moderator for the day, Mr. Ganesh Rajkupal, and it's an honor to have you today with us, sir. Mr. Ganesh has a 15 years of consistent uninterrupted growth profile with international exposure in business development, client-based expansion, diversifying product lines, increasing revenue streams, market penetration, and setting up international joint ventures. Well, not only this, he has traveled all around the world and have an experience of export and trade development. Now I would like to introduce our panelists for the day. Amit Raj, Lalit Dash, Manisha R, Sharanya Suresh, Sairaj Godar, and Priyam Bhutra. Over to Atharva. As the coronavirus emerged in China and further spread throughout the world, it created a major impact on the world economy, various types of businesses, and not to forget the world trade. In an unprecedented global health crisis, trade is essential to save lives and livelihoods, and international cooperation is needed to keep trade flowing. In the midst of significant uncertainty, there are four things you can do. Boost confidence in trade and global markets by improving transparency about trade-related policy actions and intentions. Keep supply chains flowing, especially for essentials such as health supplies and food. Avoid making things worse through unnecessary export restrictions and other trade barriers. And finally, even in the midst of a crisis, think beyond the immediate. Government support today needs to be delivered in a way that it ensures it serves public interests, not vested interests, and avoid becoming tomorrow's market distortions. From here onwards, I would like to leave the platform to Manisha to kickstart our panel discussion for the day. Good morning, everyone. I'm Manisha from 3B ComC, and today I will be speaking about international trade, the world trade, highlight its importance, and I'll also be running you through the WTO and how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the world trade. And finally, I would conclude by talking about the new regulations that are imposed by the WTO in the advent of this pandemic. If you can walk into a supermarket and find South American bananas or Brazilian coffee or a bottle of wine from South Africa, or probably even Belgium chocolates, then you're definitely experiencing the impacts of international trade or the world trade. International trade helps countries to expand their markets and access goods and services that otherwise might not be available domestically. International trade also helps countries in the optimum utilization of their resources. For instance, uh, several developing and underdeveloped nations, they might not be in a position to utilize their oil reserves or their mineral resources. So they import them from countries where their presence is in abundance. India, for example, it imports nearly 83% of the oil that it consumes from countries like Iraq and Saudi Arabia. By virtue of international trade, several countries are able to compete with each other, and this competition only results in lowering each country's cost of production, achieving economies of scale, specialization, and furthermore gaining comparative advantages. Um, here, I'd like to take the example of two rival nations, say the US and China. Um, US it basically produces aircraft parts, machinery, gadgets, while China is more onto producing uh, footwear or clothing and even electronic gadgets as well. Though these countries, they have a lot common in producing stuff that are similar in nature, what they export is completely different. And that is where comparative advantage comes into picture. 
while china it has a big textile setup and it also has abundance labor it exports more of clothing and footwear while countries like the us uh, it has robust technological sectors and it mainly exports aircraft parts or your machine parts and furthermore international trade also helps um, several countries for example the republic of congo or um, ireland singapore malaysia these countries have benefited tremendously from international trade both directly as well as indirectly international trade also helps countries and people across the globe to improve the qualities of life the standard of living and also gain access to diversified products where, and set up new customer bases um apart from this it also facilitates your fdis i'm sure all of you must have heard about foreign direct investments it also helps in stabilizing the economies and it has countless other benefits now who is the one who is responsible for conducting and ensuring that all these trade happens smoothly and who is the one who sets up the framework for the rules and regulations that have to be abided by by different nations so here the wto or the world trade organization comes into picture um established in 1995 the wto is the only global international organization that uh, deals with the trade rules between nations uh it helps to set up framework where trade commences smoothly freely and predictably and besides this the wto its main purpose is to ensure that there is free lines of communication between its 164 member nations as of present and it ensures that uh, any disputes are arising between these countries are settled properly negotiated well now how has covid-19 impacted the world trade now covid-19 is a humanitarian crisis and it has presented the world in front of an unprecedented public health challenge as you all know and worldwide all nations are struggling to curb the spread of the disease but whatever measures they have taken to a large extent is only shutting down swathes of the world economy um it has um the according to the imf report the growth rate of the, of the world economy for this year is only 3% in 2021 which is far worse than the 2009 financial crisis and there is a worldwide demand i would say an unprecedented demand for medical equipment and or like your masks or your ventilators and uh, this is further worsened as several countries have imposed restrictions on their exports and also their imports as well um and in the event of this pandemic several countries are also trying to manufacture these goods in house so that they can save up on their costs they are coming up with innovative supply chain ideas i would like to quote an example of this british company hope technologies it's basically into manufacturing your bicycle equipments but when this pandemic commenced um it has uh, repurposed all of its staff it has repurposed all of its machineries uh, in order to produce parts for ventilators job loss i would say is one of the most severe immediate impacts of the covid-19 pandemic and more than half a billion people across the globe have lost their jobs 56% of those from the urban sectors and mostly the self employed people and the remaining from the rural sectors and these are mainly your casual workers and several multinational companies have stopped their overseas operations they have retaliated they have um, come back to their home country and they have tried to you know suspend several of their ongoing operations in the advent of this pandemic keeping um in place your uh, working from home uh, or your uh, trade restrictions that are being invoked in the world economy now those though these multinationals they have their own business continuity plans and your crisis management plans that had been set up they had to be revamped uh, in the advent of this pandemic now what has now even in this crisis uh, transportation i'd see uh, to a large extent it has been shut down in most of the countries it could be your public transport your domestic transport so this is why a lot of supply chains have been disrupted and talking about what the wto has done uh, with respect to uh, the covid-19 pandemic um it has gone by and taken into consideration the notifications that are provided by the wto members as well as other countries i would say nearly 80 countries have uh, imposed restrictions on their imports 
And uh, out of these, there are 46 WTO members and the remaining non-WTO members. Um, and two thirds of the notifications that are sent to the WTO mainly consisted of uh, regulations and restrictions that includes your technical barriers to your sanitary and phytosanitary measures. And uh, most of the notifications that were sent to the WTO were um, those that mainly affect your supply chain, your food, animals, uh, live animals, transportation, your, food, your supply chains, um, as well as your medical goods and equipment. So there were several countries that actually relaxed their policies on the uh, import of several medical equipments and food supplies. Like I'd like to quote Indonesia, for example, they um, temporarily relaxed their fortification of uh, food items. And several countries have also streamlined certification and authorization processes so that um, the food supplies and other medical equipments, they enter the country smoothly and easily. Uh, and several countries have also restricted their exports completely so that they first cater to their immediate needs and make sure that they are self-sufficient before going and reaching out and helping to the world. So uh, these were some of the measures that the WTO felt necessary uh, to take up the advent of this pandemic. Yeah, well said, Manisha. So uh, like, I guess all of us can agree that international trade is quite important, uh, you know, uh, on a world stage and very important for a country's development and growth to service their population's needs and generating employment opportunities and for the much lower like foreign direct investment, as he just said. For the last few years, you know, uh, there have been various countries which are having an inward shift and the rising tide of populism or nationalism has actually threatened the very identity of WTO. And it stands, but uh, originally WTO was supposed to stand on three pillars mainly, you know, to monitor whether the members are acting within the rules, setting up new or amend the rules as per uh, the time changes, and they're basically the dispute settlement system. But over the last few years, you know, uh, all these three functions are not functioning as it was supposed to function. And COVID has just amplified all the differences and responses from various countries as more like well, for themselves, not on a world stage uh, looking at it, a united front. And they have imposed restrictions on medicine products, food items, among a lot of uh, other restrictions as such. The recovery I see is like going to be a long process and the world needs to present a united front, you know, or else there will be many poor countries and the LDCs, the least developed nations, which will be left behind. Before we get into the new world order and the roles which are played by various regions, various countries, let's look, uh, have a look at the two more important sectors, you know, which uh, are having a, a profound effect today. It's the service sector and the medicine sector. So just uh, we'll have a discussion on that and then we'll probably move on more to the WTO and the other countries, what their role they are playing. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Sharanya from 2B um, The COVID-19 pandemic has brought considerable attention to trade in medical products and especially trade in products for prevention, testing and treatment. I will be addressing a few integral aspects with regards to trade in medical goods in the context of tackling COVID-19. Uh, to make it easy, let's classify it broadly into four main categories. Medicines, medical supplies, medical equipment and technology, personal protective products. All countries need to work to ensure the flow of vital medical supplies and work to resolve disruptions to the global supply chains to support the health and well-being of all people. The statistics of the world medical products 2019 totaled to 2 trillion with exports and imports together. Medicines are the largest category uh, which represents 56% of the total imports of medical products, followed by medical supplies with a share of 17%, medical equipment at 14 pro personal protective equipment at 13 The top importers are US, Germany and China together at 34%. Speaking of the biggest bilateral trade partner for medical products, it's US and Germany. Both are the main suppliers to China uh, for the years 2017 to 2019. The top exporters are Germany, US and Switzerland. Medical products have been exported. Almost 35% have been exported by U Germany, US and Switzerland. Medical exports of Ireland and Switzerland amounted to 38% and 29% respectively. 
which highlights the importance of their products to their respective economies. Ireland's total exports are 31.5% and Switzerland's at 47%, which is extremely beneficial for their, econo uh, for their economy at this point of time. Uh, the PPEs like hand soap, sanitizer, face masks, protective spectacles are being exported by China, Germany and US. Medical equipment and technology are being exported by Singapore, US, Netherlands and China. The World Trade Organization promotes liberalization of medical trade. In general, accessibility of medicines increases after liberal, liberalization liberalization i'm so sorry in the pharmacy sector because numerous new pharmacies and dispensaries are usually established we all know about the shortage of ventilators and pps in the beginning of this pandemic and also when the cases went up interesting fact there was a hack by a doctor in the us who used one ventilator for four patients by using a four-way splitter as one life-saving machine can push 2000 milliliters of oxygen into a 20, 280 kg body, which actually means ventilators were underutilized till then. Vaccines. Uh, there are major developments uh, of the coronavirus vaccine happening across the globe, where countries like United States, UK, Germany and China are working on it. As we all know, uh, something we all should be proud of, India is in the phase three trials of its vaccine, which actually means India can convert the corona crisis into an, into an amazing opportunity. Now, uh, let's talk about the service sector. Service sectors have been heavily affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. Given the sector's role in providing inputs for, for other economic activities, including facilitating supply chains and trade in goods, disruptions in services supply are having a broad economic and trade impact. The first one is the tourism travel related services. The global tourism and travel sector, which includes services such as hotels, restaurants, tour operators and travel agencies, has arguably been the hardest hit by the crisis so far, given that mobility restrictions and border closures halted the moment of tourism abroad. In 2020, international tourism has fallen down by 60 to 70 percent. For example, uh, Maldives, which is a famous uh, place whose economy depends on tourism, Approximately 22,000 employees, local payroll employees of restaurants have been affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, job security beyond July was uncertain for majority of the restaurant employees. Secondly comes the distribution ag agencies, um, uh, which have been again heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. As social distancing measures in several countries have involved the closure of shops considered non-essential, which means so many people have lost their jobs. For example, in China, data published by the NBS, that's the National Bureau of Statistics, found that retail trade in China had declined by 20.5% compared to the previous year. Telecommunications and visual, audiovisual services with more people currently participating in both remote work, schooling and more heavily dependent on the internet for uh, entertainment and social contact. The demand for information and communication technology services and related infrastructure has increased. Um, the crisis is focusing greater attention on the online supply se in sectors such as retail, health, education, telecommunication and audiovisual services, accelerating companies' efforts to expand online operations and creating new customer behaviors that are likely to contribute to a profound and long-term uh, shift towards online services. To conclude, uh, as we all know, the country that comes up with the vaccine will be extremely benefited and the top exporters are benefited as well, even during these tough times. While online services are increasing, new apps are coming up in the market. We will be seeing big changes in the market post COVID-2. Yeah. Just to sum it up, like as is common with uh, every pandemic or every outbreak of such thing, the first or the most immediate focus is always on the medical sector and how or which countries are going to benefit from that, uh, you know, devastating impact. So again, COVID is uh, no stranger to that. It's uh, going to be the same. The countries manufacturing the PPEs, the medical products like China, US, Germany, Switzerland, Ireland, these will have an edge going forward. And uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, have a real good uh, chance to monetize the opportunities very well. The race for the vaccine again is and the manufacturing centers for it, the supply chains. You know, again, they are going to uh, also uh, have an impact and the first movers advantage will always be there. And as for the service sector, 
it has been thrown upside down you know it contributes to around 40% of the world's trade so tourism distribution logistics services all these have been massively impact and uh, all this will also have a profound impact on the way international trade moves forward whether we see uh, you know uh, a more digitization of the economy more online supply of education medical or retail kind of services again that's going to be something which we can wait and watch how we are going to move forward and how long it takes us to recover is going to be a fascinating uh, thing to watch out from so now let's try and uh, discuss a bit more about the world order you know which was pre covid and post covid and how like the major regions like china us eu and these places have uh, been having an impact on the way international trade functions so let's begin with china and then we will move on to the other regions um <clears throat> hello everybody in the course of 18 1980s and 1990s china emerged as a major player in the global economy indeed no other country had ever expanded its role so rapidly its foreign trade incre increased explosively from about 20 billion dollars in the late 1970s to force 75 billion dollars in 2000s by the early 2000 its share of the world trade had quadrupled as compared with 1977 and as early as 1995 china had become one of the top 10 trading countries in the world simultaneously china attracted record am record amounts of foreign direct investments for much of the decade in the of the 1990s china was the world's second largest recipient of foreign direct investment following only the united states by the end of 1990s the total the total stock of foreign direct investment in china accounted for almost a third of the cumulative foreign direct investment in all the developing countries in the world cumulative foreign investment in china far exceeded by the total stock of foreign direct investment in countries such as mexico and brazil which opened their doors to direct investments decades before china now in two, in the early 2001s uh, at the in, in the year of 2001 china joined the wto with a few uh, conditions as uh, in december 11th now 2016 they would open up to market economic status but what exactly happened in at uh, december 11th 19 uh, 2016 was eu and us retaliated us retaliated for major reasons because they wanted to stay as the super economy or the global uh, the number one eco economy in the world and they feared that if china gets market economic status then it will export out its cheap products even better and people will want to buy that the same reason why european union parliament passed out a constitution within their own uh, regions and though this uh, constitution uh, this uh, document is not binding by the wto but then they decided that they wouldn't want to grant uh, china the access of uh, market economic status whereas china retaliated saying that we joined the wto with only one condition that we would increase our foreign direct in, uh, sorry our uh, exports and we would have a better status in the world and this was the only reason why we came in 2001 but then in the year of 2013 uh, mr xi jinping and his government came out with an initiative called as the belt and road initiative i'm pretty sure a uh, quite a few people know already what belt and road initiative or the bri is commonly called as so the bri is a i would say a, a huge project which china has been planning from quite some time and its basic intention is to revive the old 18th century's uh, silk road Uh, into the 21st century silk road so just just to give you a small representation imagine if this is india and this is china here so china connects the road uh, it connects through road it goes through the suez canal then it comes back to pakistan then goes on to sri lanka and then connects back up so it creates a 21st century silk road again it, it also has something called as the polar silk road which it is expanding towards the arctic regions but then majority of the investment goes goes down into uh, the bri initiative and now the bri bri initiative is estimated accordingly uh, by the chinese government is estimated to be about uh, 8 to 10 trillion dollars and it is ma majoritively focused in the african nation now why africa as we know africa was a economically deprived country but it has abundant amount of economic resources such as bauxite reserves or even cotton and the trade routes and and even egypt is connected to european union so what china did is they came out with these unique debt trap investments 
uh, to the African nations, saying that they would loan them uh, quite some amount of money, which would be double amount of GDPs also at particular cases, and they would give them it for no interest or very very minimum amount of interest. Now the African nations got very fascinated by this, and they definitely wanted the money, so they accepted the offer. But then there was of course a drawback to it, saying that the Chinese government uh, will give this money only in one condition that a Chinese company has to do the development project over there so an example can be in guinea as we know guinea has a lot of bauxite reserves right and how does china export its aluminum from there is basis of one condition that they have uh, employed the tbed company which remo- which has its own chinese employees and it gets the all the bauxite reserves to china and then they process it over there and then china exports it out to the world and the same way ethiopia's uh, cotton investment also that we know with china at the same time china has invested quite a lot of amount in pakistan and sri lanka and man- many other countries but europe and us are far from the ones who worry about the impact of bri and indeed have less cause for it in any case thanks to that powerful economies beijing cannot throw them around as easily as smaller economies in africa and also but also in southeast asia and latin america but china is relentlessly re- relentlessly expanding its power xi jinping has uh, president xi jinping has tirelessly stressed about how belt and road seeks to create a community of common destiny and is re- reiterated in focus into the fundamental issue of development and release the potential growth of these various countries and deliver the benefits to all but in reality bri has turned into a chinese neocolonialist neocolonialist project the reason behind it is china's economic logic to continuously fuel economic growth chinese companies in sectors such as aluminum steel and cement and have created massive production over capacities however the country's economy is setting into a more of modest growth rate compared to the future boom years these companies are hard pressed to keep their production lines running by the chinese government and investing into a big extractive infrastructure projects abroad as a consequence china is pushed to exploit foreign raw materials especially minerals foreign fuels agricultural commodities for its per- per- perpetually hungry industries on virtually every content every content but considering its wealth in resources required by the chinese industries africa has emerged as the main target as i mentioned before and it is no doubt that it has presence in 39 countries through the bri and africa is its biggest trade partner in conclusion i would just want to say that i'm sorry uh, i would just like to say that make no mistake we are living through history at the moment and trying times like this are roughest speculation about what the future may hold one of the biggest answers that everybody wants is what is going to become of the nation that is the logical starting point of this economic turmoil the idea that they're going to fall behind massively has a vindictive quality to it but the truth is it probably won't be the case we all know of the people that use economic downturns like this to buy cheap shares or real estate and then sell them accordingly it's likely that china will do this the same but with their foreign direct currency reserves and direct lending portfolio they will be in a condition of buying the entire nations just because something feels right or because it's fair or even because it seems logical doesn't necessarily make it true introspectively we all have to admit that there that just a little bit of we that that just a little bit of us want the reports to be true that china will fall in the future but i personally feel that's not going to be the case because china has trapped the african countries majoritively through various different kinds of investments and africa is bound to them in the future thank you yeah just to add to what you said you know uh, let's be clear let's be clear there that uh, you know the identity of wto has been under threat for quite a while now you know and the new world order it's always been there just it's just that covid is kind of amplifying it and you know uh, we have had problems with wto on their dispute redressal system their their consensus uh, based decision making system and us is not quite fond of it right now it's basically against wto especially under trump and eu has not actually come forward and filled any kind of a weed leadership vacuum china's trade practices have not been curtailed so you know uh, there is a, there are a lot of uh, issues with wto and i think it's uh, these problems will only increase in the future and it's kind of uh, tough to be a bit optimistic about how uh, you know the multilateral trading system will uh, go about in the future especially most of the countries 
would be interested in uh, probably having regional trade agreements or bilateral trade agreements. But until and unless uh, WTO can reform drastically uh, going forward, it's going uh, to be a tough, uh, you know, uh, try to bring everyone together. We will also probably have, a, you know, uh, the next discussion about how the space is going to be occupied by US and EU. And then probably we'll uh, just have a further discussion on the least developing countries and then uh, take it forward. So whenever we consider any conversation or any scenario regarding the World Trade Organization, we always look at it in a very bad light. Now, to draw this scenario, it is predicted that the World Trade Organization in all of its trade would fall down between 13 to 32 percent. That's almost 17 or 18 different GDPs from the countries that are present in Africa. Now, realizing all of these, each and every person that has predicted something to happen in the future regarding world trade has always predicted that countries would step away from the World Trade Organization and instead enter into unilateral and bilateral trade agreements between each other, thereby making World Trade Organization just a fiduciary organization just for its namesake, which would be applicable only for the really small economies for intertrading amongst them. Now, whenever we consider any of these factors, we also need to consider the various changes in scenarios that occurred due to the COVID pandemic. I have basically drawn out a conclusion that this would happen in five phases. The first phase, which we have already been through, is the localized impact. The localized impact meaning human lockdown, there would be a demand shock, production shock, and the closure of ports. The second wave, which would be short to medium term, would basically be the diversion of routes, the increased cost of goods in general, as well as the interruption to the uh, ports and clearance and interruptions and delays in shipments in general, which we have already witnessed. Currently, we reside in the third wave, which is the effect on the trade and capital flows. Now, there will be changes in the trade flows and the way that we do our work. To put it in scenario, imagine this. India earlier on used to be in constant trade with China regarding a lot of its, you know, manufacturing materials such as coal, such as steel, raw steel, iron steel, and many other re refined minerals such as, um, you know, bauxite and so on and so forth. However, post this pandemic, we are moving towards a more... Um, independent scenario wherein we would have to divert these trade flows to another country, which we are working on currently with many of the Middle Eastern countries as well. That would also mean that there would be changes in international priceation in general. The World Trade Organization, the way it works is that it helps maintain a particular pricing scenario. If people are to, you know, um, exchange currencies in a particular way, like if they are supposed to exchange more currencies in Indian rupees rather than US dollars, that would mean that the valuation systems for Indian rupees in general would increase, therefore causing a huge disturbance to the already preset world currency valuation systems, thereby changing what we see of the world in terms of trade and in terms of how we value a country entirely. There would also be changes in the entirety of the capital flow because people will be choosing to invest in particular countries and disinvesting from many others. Now, when we come to the fourth wave, it is basically the implications that these waves will have on the international market as a whole. This is a very long term approach, which would basically mean that everybody would start sourcing most of their materials and their minerals and every other thing from different countries. That is the common consensus that we believe in right now, that we would be shifting away from getting our materials and resources from China and other countries would follow the same as well. However, this would mean that there would be revised new tariffs and new taxation policies implemented. Realizing the fact that many of these countries will enter into unilateral and bilateral trade agreements with each other, this would mean new taxation policies between these two countries would be formed, making to a fact that the entirety of the way that we deal with systems in general of the World Trade Organization would basically be reduced down to nothing. When we come to the fifth wave, that's the implications of the entirety of markets present that are already existing, they would have altered trade relations and they would also obviously have altered international relations. Now imagine this, each and every scenario that has occurred in the past, which has led to a different change in the international organization or in the international uh, changes in terms of policies has always occurred due to trade. The United States is one, at the forefront regarding these. Now, the United States coming election is going to play a major role on its next set of trade policies as well as its international policies. If Trump, if the Trump administration is to be reelected for another term, it would basically mean that they would stay affirmed to the fact that they would be sourcing most of their manufacturing processes in-house that is in the United States and making United States great again. So whenever we consider these factors, it would mean that there would be a general rise in prices 
of the entirety of us products of a whole because of obvious reasons such as increased labor cost increased technological cost and so on and so forth so whenever we consider these factors in terms of the united states there will always be a huge recession that many predict will happen simply because of the fact that the us imports have not decreased substantially they have only decreased by around 8 to 10% however their exports have decreased to a whopping 13 to 30% est in estimates regarding different uh, you know uh, uh, different industries and different uh, eco uh, micro economies in general now whenever we consider these factors the united states elections plays a major role in terms of its economic policies if the trump administration continues it will basically mean that the imports from china would reduce and they would be more dependent however what that would play in terms of their own economy would be a huge question mark when we consider the european union the european union has stand affirmed on the fact that they will only be shifting the manufacturing process to completely to China and focus up on the technological aspects. If their technological aspects are to play the forefront, that would mean that they would have no changes in the way that they're currently working and they're building forward to becoming the technological prowess of the entire world. They would, instead of manufacturing in-house, they would obviously ex, um, you know, outsource it to China and make China the biggest powerhouse in terms of manufacturing industries that the entire world has seen. And they themselves would be the ones that would be providing the services as well as the technical expertise required for this, thereby dividing the work. And EU, in general, would not play the role of a leader. Now, whenever we consider these factors, we also have to note that if in case the European Union decides to change its, any of its policies, or if the United States, you know, has Joe Biden elected or any other representative elected who does change this entire Make America Great Again economic policies, that would mean that China, in turn, would either benefit or lose. If the European Union was not, if was to produce anything in-house, that again would mean that a particular a period of recession would come about in European Union. However, it would mean that China would lose out. But lose out how? Lose out not a lot, because the entirety of the rest of the world exists. And European Union and USA in general would not be able to export anything to these other countries and not be able to comparatively if and effectively compete with the technological and manufacturing prowess of China. When we consider these factors, we obviously need to look at China as one of the most emerging countries in the world in terms of trade currently, despite many common uh, adherences to the fact that because of Corona, China will reduce its trade and everything. That again is a misconception because currently since April 2020 till about September 2020, the increase in EU and China exports and imports has been a whopping 13 to 14%, which has been the highest increase that they have seen and recorded since 2018 in general. So in conclusion, I'd like to say this. Yes, there are many scenarios where we see, you know, a lot of people being self-independent and self-approachable in terms of their economies. However, it cannot be denied that China might just be the next superpower that takes hold of an entire sector or an entire part of trade in general for the whole entire world. Yes. Yeah, just to add that, like, uh, see, uh, as we all know that US is uh, what it's going through and the November elections and all that. So how it uh, functions going forward, I don't uh, still I don't see a scenario where, you know, they can reduce their dependence on China because of the trade deficit which they have with them. Same for EU because they have uh, their own set of problems, you know, uh, with the uh, Brexit and uh, then uh, Germany and France also having their own issues. So no one is ready to actually take up a leadership role. So and uh, their connectivity with China is uh, far too great uh, to just remove them in the short to medium term. So as of now, I can uh, we think we have a consensus as such that, you know, China has a, a big advantage, even though there is a lot of negativity going around or floating around with respect to COVID and the association with China and stuff like that. So uh, to just sum it up, you know, it's going to be something fascinating to watch in the next couple of decades, especially what uh, if there is something which can come up uh, and counter China. And uh, to also let's uh, not forget the least developed nations, you know, because they are all obviously the most uh, neglected part of the world trade. So just we'll just uh, throw some light on that and then move on with the discussion. So hey everyone. Uh, so as the uh, as the COVID-19 pandemics far reaching consequences for the global economy, the least development countries, which is LDCs, face the most difficulty challenges, a lack of resources to support an economic rebound uh, in the compounded LDCs dependent on the limited range of products exported 
to new to few months, some of which have been those the worst affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. The pandemic threatens to derail hard won development gains in the LDCs. The year 2020 started with a quite depressed trade performance in 2019. The value of LDC's export of goods and services declined by 1.6% in 2019. A greater decline that has the world export, which is 1.2%. Consequently, the shares of LDCs in the world trade also registered a marginal decline, falling to 0.91% in 2019. The expected downturn in the trade in 2020 is in 2019 declining demand and the supply uh, of these uh, as well as the supply or disruption have weighted significantly in the LDC's exports especially exports of textile and clothing products LDC's dependence on the tourism revenue have seen the sector comes to the virtually standstill as migrant workers from the LDC's return from the host countries affected by the pandemic and flow to the remittation a critical sources of the foreign exchange for the many countries has dra drastically dried up. All of these factors are predicted to worsen further for the upcoming months. The ongoing pandemic may affect the near term prospects for some countries to graduate from the LDC status. Uh, countries like Angola and Vanuatu, which of the schedule to graduate soon and LDCs such as the Bangladesh, which are on the path to the graduation of the next few years have been experiencing unavoidable decline in economic growth and export earnings. The LDCs have called for the countries to refrain from export prohibition and restriction of the medical goods and food, of which many of the net exporters. Several LDCs have lower duties on the medical goods to ensure their availability at more affordable price to their citizens. Since the start of the pandemic, at least two thirds of the LDCs have put on the place of the variety of lockdown measures. Some LDCs have announced stimulate, stimulatious, uh, stimulated packages, stimulated packages, which has covered export oriented sectors. They have also strengthened healthcare system and ensured social relief packages and liquidity support to small medium enterprises, which is SMEs. The International community has announced support measures ranging from the debt relief to strengthening social sectors and providing social safety nets for the most vulnerable countries, maintaining this momentum while redoubling coordination efforts remain virtual as the whole world to move towards to the global economy recovery. So this is where the trade policy uh, uh, of the World Trade Organization comes comes under the WTO has been monitoring the trade related measures government has introduced in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. A significant number of these measures are temporarily export restrictions imposed on the medical goods. There are there have also been several trade facilities measures such as temporary and the unilaterally withdrawal of the tariffs to facilitate imports of these goods and the products. Some non-tariff measures associated with the trade uh, in these goods, example, elimination of non-automatic licensing procedure or introduction to the special ex export licensing requirements are also being taken under by the members of members to combat the impact of the crisis. A licensing requirements are also being taken by the members to combat the impact of the crisis. A number of members have adopted measures to the temporarily prohibit or restrict exports of the foods and agriculture products. Some of the export ban introduced earlier have been now lifted and also international community for all these international communities can come together and support LDCs as the World Trade Organization can reduce the tariffs on the goods imported and exported from the LDCs and can give more preference to the natural resources and here the uh, part comes for the India that they can create a good uh, partnership and relationship in terms of the business and they can uh, with the LDCs and they can uh, give the good ease of doing businesses uh, with these LDCs. 
okay uh, ldcs have been going through a tough time uh, you know and for them uh, the importance of uh, an organization and, uh, like wto cannot be you know more stark so it has to function so that they are not forgotten you know they are facing a lot of problems basically they are uh, economies which have like uh, one or two uh, primary source of uh, foreign earning uh, you know products like uh, or which are they are going but again they are facing uh, declining demand in the world market they are, say, they are facing uh, you know shortage in supply the immediate impact has of course uh, been on the medical uh, infrastructure it's not strong enough to handle a pandemic like covid and uh, in case of all these export restrictions they are uh, going to face a tough time but in the medium and long term you know they need the support of the international community so that they can bounce back and they can actually uh, do well uh, do well at the world stage you know, so it's up to uh, all the developed nations as well as developing nations like uh, india to you know give them the proper support so that they can also you know uh, benefit from world trade and uh, for the last segment we'll just move on to the actions which have been taken uh, by the indian government and also at the world at large and to look how uh, you know covid has affected us and we are uh, making an effort to handle this uh, changes and the pandemic on a worldwide stage thank you so much sir uh, good morning one and all present here uh, i'll be speaking about today the action plan regarding the indian government and the world economy what can be done in a post covid era so that we can come back to equilibrium like we were let's say in february 2020 So starting off, sir, I will first uh, like to uh, try and cover the world economy part of it, and try to cover uh, uh, as much as I can regarding how we are going to sustain a rather global economy. So it was the former UN Secretary General Dan Hammes Gold who ha- famously said that the United Nations was not created to save uh, to take mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell. This current time that we are seeing that has affected the entire world equally is nothing but uh, our journey to hell, and this the United Nations and international organizations are going to save us from it, and we have to make sure that we restore our faith in these international organizations. World economy is nothing but the trade and commerce between uh, multiple states, and only when multiple countries and states actually coordinate with each other for the mutual benefit of one another can we sustain a global economy so number one point would be restoring faith in international organization and transnational organizations like uh, let's say the imf the world bank the opec the asean and so on and so forth we have international organizations for every single continent for every single uh, particular uh, area of interest like the indian ocean region etc the quad is an organization that was made for the indian ocean region so the number one is restoring faith number two is providing greater autonomy to this organi- to these organizations with president donald trump withdrawing from the who after uh, dr ted ross the director general of uh, who's remarks is not a good sign for a healthy uh, international cooperation between organizations and uh, member states so that obviously has to be avoided so that internationally we can cooperate with one another and uh, providing greater autonomy also means that they have a larger mandate to deal with instead of focusing only in emergency driven areas for them to prepare for an emergency should be the responsibility that we should give them thirdly sir we need to call a temporary truce in order to make sure that we actually are able to live up beyond this uh, economically live beyond this uh, covid-19 pandemic temporary truce which means that japan uh, and south korea both of these countries are in a trade war against china united states was a tra- was in a trade war with china before this we need to call a temporary truce for that because now is not the time to uh, make sure that the egos of world leaders or member states of the united nations is fulfilled but to make sure that the entire world grows together and th- th- which means that at least for the time being you stop imposing tariffs on each other and make sure that the global uh, global initiative is at the forefront as of now then the most important point regarding this sir which you have mentioned yourself would be to resist protectionism and strengthen globalism nothing that i have spoken above before this will be effectable uh, will be effective or will be implementable if countries start looking inwards only they need to start looking outwards the mentalities that world leaders have such as jair bolsonaro in brazil or if it is donald trump in usa or it is uh, uh the president of philippines all of them are looking within and their workers are suffering because international companies are not able to sustain because of the economy the finance ministry of that particular country or the treasury secretary is not willing to cooperate with them this entire mentality that the american government has of america first has not led them anywhere apart from america being first in the number of covid cases around the world and highest number of deaths 
in the world so we have to make sure that global globalism at least as of now for this covid-19 pandemic is at the forefront and later like priyam said later can be the uh, other motives or initiatives that one can take for their own electoral benefits but as of now electoral benefits must be set aside because people are losing their lives every single day if not because of the virus uh, it is because of unemployment that is caused that has been caused by the virus so strengthening globalism is uh, 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 the majority in uh, perspective as of now now coming to india sir before i get to what exactly india should do regarding this covid-19 pandemic and regarding how they can sustain uh, an economy uh, i'll i'll be speaking to you about what they have done already and then i can give you like further on explain as to how they can take away from different uh, for former prime ministers and then they can take away from models that have been set before by other countries in the world so as of now till now we have seen that in in late march 2020 as soon as the lockdown was imposed within a 4 hours notice prime minister modi announced 20 lakh crores and upwards of that since then that is 10% of the gdp to covid 19 measures and to sustain a, a good economy and also to ensure that enough funds are given to hospitals and healthcare workers etc etc second we saw tax measures we saw a pay difference and then we saw rate reduction for taxes even uh, very recently the uh, finance ministry has extended the date for the submission of taxes it has been extended to 31st december 2020 then we saw compensation schemes coming into place we saw uh, an increase in food security and lastly we saw medical insurance all of these measures are extremely uh, lucrative in nature they're extremely luminous in for us to go forward with and in the ideation stage of it but until and unless we implement it on ground that means the remotest of remote villages until they don't get the benefits of this food security scheme it's not going to make any difference now uh, coming to what they can do it was in uh, on 20 uh, on on 15th of august 2009 when the then prime minister of india uh manmohan singh stood at the ramparts of the red fort and then gave his independence day address to the nation after they had just gone through uh the the, the worst financial crisis that the world had seen since the great depression the, the global recession of 2008 and him being an economist himself told the country what exactly he has done and what exactly he is going to do what we see right now is not a, that much of a stark difference from that day because even though uh, there was a recession now now we see that india's gdp recently has gone to minus 23% minus 27 and upwards of that so it is not a big difference so i'm going to give you the solution that were implemented then and that we can go ahead and follow now number 1 we have to move from a material based economy a material resource based economy to a human resource based economy we have to focus on the people first treating the individual as the, uh, of the paramount importance instead of the resource we started digging holes or we started digging queries in northeast india all of it is not going to impact us if indians in self in mainland or northeast india get their benefit of employment so we have to focus on the individual providing employment for them starting off new supply chain management not only employing people in factories but also employing them in distribution in transport in all of this ensuring that the, all of business is sustained at once number 2 uh, so uh, initiatives like the manrega and all can come into the picture number 2 is lowering interest number 3 is the uh, i would say a very effective mode that the people have taken or that countries have taken it's expanding credit now in 1987 a very huge financial crisis as soon since the financial markets had come into place so stock market came into place in 1987 a very huge financial crisis stock market crash happened which is called the black monday 1987 we've even seen traces of this particular day in the movie wolf of the wall street that was the black monday of 1987 when prices fell so low and even the stock market crash so bad that millions of people lost their job what the uh, treasury secretary did that time was expand credit when japan was hit with the financial crisis the financial bubble burst in 2001 everybody predicted that this entire decade of 2001 to 2010 will be a lost decade for the country of japan and its economy but japan was able to recover from that because of the expanding credit option that they had which means the lender of last resort india has to indulge in lender of last resort which means that they don't have to now do what the finance ministries of other states are saying that they're doing they're not paying away G- gst recompensation to these states we have to indulge in giving away gst first then also lending on top of that if the states require because there's no point being stingy towards your own state governments if the people of your own country are dying because of unemployment and lastly sir reducing excise duties uh, changing the fiscal policy not only changing the fiscal policy but getting more people in 
to amend the fiscal policy and make decisions for the republic of india which means getting the uh, reserve bank of india involved getting the planning commission involved and getting the finance ministry and all of the state governments involved in an active role so let's say uh, for any particular incident happens then uh, a commission is set up a commission is set up that that looks into it former chief justices are brought in exactly for this one you can have former rbi governors that come in for example dv subbara who was the former rbi governor you can have former finance secretaries come in and given their piece or two and then make sure that crisis management happens as an inclusive measure because in times of dire necessity you cannot uh, look to only have your own people to look uh, only have all of the powers concentrated in the hands of one office that is the finance ministry's office so uh, expanding the responsibility will make sure that according to the situation that means the situation in 2021 that is february 2021 will be in stark difference to situation now so having only one plan will not make any sense but having a robust plan that keeps changing according to the dynamics of this virus and let's say in the situation that a vaccine does come across what is going to be the measure that can be taken from there on only the planning commission and the expertise of the rbi and finance ministry can do it together not alone so that is the last thing uh, that i'd like to say sir uh, regarding this i would reiterate again as my last point in conclusion is that again protectionism and non cooperation whether it is within states a country like india which tries to focus its powers financial powers in the hands of the ministry or in the hands of one minister is not going to help looking outwards getting in as many people as you can with the world economy is also the same uh, principle that matters that is trying to get as many people as uh, as you can involved trying to get as many member states only then can we have any hope for a better economy and a better future a sustainable future thank you very much yeah so i think there have been some effective points raised from different viewpoints uh, in this discussion so just to summarize i would like to uh, you know say that we are facing some unprecedented times and something no government could have actually prepared for or was prepared for and to get uh, to get out of the current mess you know we have to probably think out of the box at the company level at the economy level at the government level at, at each level be proactive try to plan and do things much more uh, in a much better way like uh, what we have been doing let's get one thing straight like uh, we all agree that international trade uh, cannot be wished away you know how much our the anti globalization camps or nationalistic forces are at play here but international uh, trade will always be there and uh, hopefully we can find the way out of the current mess with a much more effective wto or a, another you know a reformed multilateral trade system and which is ably supported by all the developed nations like the us the eu and uh, china and the developing countries and we don't leave uh, other countries behind whether it's a pipe dream or whether something of that sort can actually be achieved in uh, future years or decades is something which we have to wait and watch and uh, i thank you all once again for uh, you know uh, some really uh, good uh, points of which we had debated here and uh, thank you very much yeah Okay, guys. We open the session for the Q and A now. If you guys have any questions, just drop that in the chat box, and that will be answered by the panelists. Hi, Lalit. We just received a question for you. So, what are the possible ways to counter the Chinese threat by India at the world stage? Um. Okay, fine. Um, I would say. chinese threat to so the indian government has already taken a few contractive measures as we know in the past few days and are promoting atmanirbhar or made in india policy and as sairaj and priyam also said about protectionist policies india has been trying to do it but at the same time you have to realize that china has its roots in all ways possible so even if you are producing a ppe suit in india the machines are manufactured in china and i wouldn't say this is practically possible or this wouldn't be possible in the next two years but then a phase wise plan to cut down your relations with china will be possible but then the government or and the officials have to look into it but if you say that banning pubg or uh, banning other apps in india cuts off ties with china that doesn't make sense that was just a security reason but at the same time why wasn't it done 3 years back if you knew that china is already looking into your data uh, a phase wise uh, plan is the one which will help you cut ties with china but it will not
completely eradicate your ties with China. It'll help you minimize it. That's what I would say. Just to add to that, like, uh, see, uh, everyone is anti-China or like they are having those uh, things in mind. But, uh, you know, blocking China totally, I think at the moment, uh, the way things stand is quite not possible. And uh, uh, despite the best intentions, it has to be a, you know, global coalition where all the developed countries and the developing uh, countries come forward. And even then, it has to be phase wise. You know, you cannot just wish away China that, OK, today I decide to ban this, I ban that because china is having uh, lots of sources where it's earning its revenue it's not just india or uh, you know uh, some other countries uh, so we got another question for priyam since you talked about the role of us and eu so how do you see the role of other major countries like australia japan uh, post pandemic is there a possible coalition which can come up against china so whenever we discuss anything about coalitions uh, in terms of them embargoing or you know posing sanctions against china is a very far fetched idea in essence all of the countries like if you take japan japan already has its trade tiff with china but that's because of historical reasons more than anything it's because of the if it's because of the history when you take into consideration australia or any other country they might have they might pose sanctions on china or might reduce the imports or exports they have with china or the trade interactions with china but in the end of it china will be catering to the other countries that these people will be trading with. So let's just take South Korea, for instance. China and South Korea have decent trade relations and will keep on trading. South Korea and Australia have one of the largest trade relations that exists. So these trades will basically be, you know, through a middle fiduciary or, you know, through a middle country in general. That would, again, increase the prices for these countries and the unavoidable trade with China that they think is unavoidable would not be so. Just to add to that, like, uh, you know, uh, again, like uh, China is having, uh, if you take an example of uh, US and EU, which would be best uh, equipped to handle a country like China. But US has a, such a massive trade deficit that they cannot, despite best inten intentions of Trump, you know, they cannot just wish away China. Even within U EU, you know, Italy is so strongly associated with China, like even if Germany and France come together into a coalition someday in the future and think, OK, we are trying to you know, shift our production sources from China and shift it somewhere else. But the question is whether the entire EU will support it. So again, Australia and Japan, it, again, as we discussed, the only possible way uh, to do it would be an international coalition. But again, uh, how it will get achieved uh, is something uh, we are all quite doubtful about, you know. Uh, Sairaj, there is a question for you. Can you mention how the world, including India, got their response wrong post COVID-19? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Sushti, and thank you for the question, uh, anybody who's asked it. Uh, in terms of what they did uh, that was wrong, the world economy, number one, as soon as the vi virus like broke out and then the COVID-19 was so serious, in uh, in sectors like Ninjiang and Xinjiang in China, that it literally dismantled the state machinery for like two months continuously. Those signs were not picked up by the world economy or the world leaders in itself. When all of this was happening, the G20 was summoned, and the G20 met in Saudi Arabia was bound to meet in February. There was also a virtual conference that was held in like late March, but still the effects of this pandemic wasn't seen. Even when the pandemic hit us. And uh, the the country, the uh, India, levied the highest or the biggest or the most gruesome lockdown in history. That is to uh, make one billion people go into lockdown in quarantine was the greatest that we've ever seen within a four hour period. But what the mistake we made or what mistake that the state leaders made was that this lockdown was going to end within the 21th uh, 21 day period. We all, all were under the impression that it will end by then and everything will go back to normal by then. So it was under that impression itself. We didn't make any other changes and only very late into the 21 day period that the uh, central government said we are going to extend it. So all of state machinery broke down then and we started reviving only in June, July. So that's one thing that uh, that we as India went wrong with. And what world leaders wrong, went wrong with again is that they picked up the traces of this very, very late. They start, if the pandemic broke out in mid-December in China, 
the world only came to consensus about it in late february and started imposing lockdown in late march if it was a bit early like for example jacinda ardern's administration in new zealand did or uh, how uh, rashid tai erdogan's uh, administration in turkey did if their approach would have been a, little, a bit faster then we would have seen a different approach to this and also financial schemes could have been uh, done earlier so according to economists according to experts there's no other thing that world economies have done wrong in terms of approaching this but just that they approached it a bit too late in terms of uh, how, how their remedies their emergency mechanisms etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah i think like everyone was uh, just wishing it is happening in some other part of the world and it will not come to our country you know so that was uh, basically everyone was kind of uh, hoping or actually thinking about it so but anyway uh, these things are here now what has happened has happened it's uh, how we come up uh, stronger and with better trade fundamentals at the international stage with better cooperation that's what we can actually look forward to now hello manisha so the last question for the day is for you from a student called wilson so the question says according to you what steps or measures need to be taken by wto to reform or reposition itself in international trade okay um so answering your question wilson um i think uh, see the wto's main intention or the main purpose that wto was formed was to ensure that everything happens out fairly between the nations like the trade regulations are established freely and they are just for all but uh, as we have witnessed that over the years the wto has not been fair towards all the countries if you see several developing nations um for them a lot of restrictions have been imposed and for a lot of developed nations they have been removed like to quote an example there was the subsidies crisis between 1997 and 2007 where uh, the us uh, they basically uh, let subsidies to their farmers and uh, they exported these goods and it affected a lot of african countries who were manufacturing the same so i think issues like that have to be resolved and besides that it has to ensure that the trade is transparent there is transparency between all the countries when it comes to global trade and we can also ensure that all the countries comply or abide by the rules that are posed by the wto and the wto is not just fair for one not fair for the others so i think these are some of the measures that i feel can be adopted and like sir mentioned before like the situation has just amplified the whole thing about the wto and its rules have to be more stringent now so that uh, everything becomes normal yeah just to add to that like uh, i guess the members have to be really transparent and you know the way they function uh, it has to be respected as a world trade body because right now uh, most of the decisions which have been taken it's been taken unilaterally and uh, even the dispute addressal system is non existent so how do you actually get something out of uh, wto and uh, you know so it has to be uh, a given take uh, from the body as well as from the all its members you know or else uh, i don't know how uh, these decisions can be uh, taken in future and how international trade can be governed at a multilateral level Okay, I think that's it. Uh, the questions for the day. So I would like to thank all the panelists, and uh, now I would like to uh, give the formal word of thanks. I Atharva consider the occasion as an honor and privilege to extend the word of thanks. Once a great man whispered, "Feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it." Today, I take the opportunity to put all my gratitude into words. on behalf of the vcom department and commerce and all the students i would like to thank our moderator mr ganesh rajgopal for taking his precious time out of his busy schedule and consenting to be the moderator so indeed your words have inspired the students and i'm sure we all learned a lot thank you sir for sharing with us your words of wisdom thank you we so have much. been we have been fortunate to be guided by our principal father daniel fernandez always you've been a constant support and you've given us a lot of encouragement thank you sir
I would also like to th- heartfully thank Dr. Suganti Payas Ma'am, the HOD of BCom Department, for her constant support and guidance. I would also like to thank Dr. Kartika Ma'am for the, being the coordinator of Commerce for her constant support, enthusiasm, and motivation in making Commerce successful. I would also like to thank my assistant coordinator of Commerce, Srishti, for coordinating with all the panelists and working hard for this event. I would like to wholeheartedly thank our panelists for their efforts. on making this panel discussion a successful one last but not the least i would like to thank all my fellow josephites for enthusiastically being part of this virtual panel discussion and motivating our panelists thank you